Good evening and welcome. I'm delighted to introduce you and welcome you to the uh, fifth landlord meetup that Habito's um, been introducing. Um, my name is Alan Fitzpatrick. I'm Director of Lending Operations at Habito. Um, we're delighted to have you here on this warm and, and sunny evening. Um, looking forward to um, taking you through the agenda. Um, I will mention before I go on to it, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions as we go along. Um, so if I just move on to what we're going to cover today, um, and then hopefully as we go along, it will give you an opportunity to add those questions, um, which we'll come back to at the latter section of the evening when we go on to the Q&A. Um, so for those of you that have joined us before, um, we've rejigged the agenda this time. Um, we're going to move straight to uh, the main act. We're delighted to have Kate Faulkner here with us again um, to talk to us about everything to do with selling, buying, managing and letting property. Um, and that's particularly relevant at this time as we move into the next phase of reopening the um, property market. Um, so we'll start with Kate in a moment. Um, we'll be then followed by myself to talk a little bit from a lender and broker perspective as Habito is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the market in terms of interest rates and uh, loan to values um, as lenders come to grips with the, the new market we're operating in. And then, as I said, at the end, we'll allow an opportunity, hopefully, for you to ask the panel of myself, Kate, and, and hopefully Martin, our MD for lending, will join us um, to answer any questions you've got after the presentations. Um, so we're delighted to have you here, and I'm going to hand over straight to Kate now to start her section. Hi, everybody. Uh, really nice to have everyone here. Uh, thanks to Habito for having me back. So um, my word, uh, has it been a busy few weeks? Um, I kind of thought, because I'm not doing too much traveling, things would be a little quieter. Um, but oh no, they decided to open up the market very, very fast. So uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, burning candles and discussions going on, which uh, I'm basically going to share with you tonight. Um, so highlights uh, of some of the changes that are going on to the property market. Um, and the big one to really understand is um, we're not just opening up the market. So if you think you're going to kind of work um, in this market like you did before, uh, that's really, really not going to happen. Um, the first thing is just to remember that as much as possible is going to be done virtually. Uh, so if you like going into agents' offices, if you like going in to see brokers, uh, doing lots of viewings, etc., those are going to be minimised um, as much as possible. So um, on viewings, for example, especially on the letting side, what they're talking about is maybe um, either as the landlord or if you've got an HMO, a lead tenant would go around and uh, a tenant could see the property if they've done a video viewing of it before, they could do that online whenever they wanted to, or as the tenant or landlord, you could go around uh, with FaceTime or with WhatsApp with the potential tenant on the phone and show them the room and show them the other kind of areas of the house. I'm gonna do a big but there because you can't just kind of walk in um, and, sh and do something like that. The second thing is lots of paperwork, and this is actually a really, really good thing. Um, there's been a lot of effort in the industry to try and drive things digitally, um, whether it's identity checks, contracts, other documents. And I have to say, there are some in this industry that really still like their Rolodex and something called paper and post. Um, and of course, we're trying to stop that as much as possible. So one thing that's definitely going to happen is that this market is going to, within the next few months, really, really become much more efficient, much more online. Great if you like that. If you don't like that so much, I am really sorry. We're all kind of going to have to use it that way. And then from a viewings perspective, um, it is if you're going to show people around the property, um, it's a matter of uh, with opening the windows, having the doors open. If you go to a viewing and somebody's not doing this, then they're not taking um, COVID seriously in my view. So it's really, really important. Um, to make sure that any agent is doing this or indeed the occupier if they're showing you around. Um, I, what we have said is where possible, we would like to see the agent do this um, and we'd like to see the person in the property out if that's possible. Um, and here's some really interesting stuff that you, you kind of have the devil's in the detail with a lot of these things when you're writing guidance, but they want to limit viewings to sort of two people. So say, for example, you're showing um, uh, a family, a house, ideally with just one 
maximum of two people to go in. One would be even better. Um, ideally, no kids, especially if they're going to be running around and understandably touching surfaces, but that is something way of uh, spreading this awful illness. And the other thing you've got to bear in mind is two people might be coming to see you, but you need to know if they're from two separate households because you will have to show them around individually. They can't then suddenly join in um, and uh, be at the property. So I know that might sound ridiculous, but again, all of the guidance that we've put forward is to really, really try and make sure that we're opening up the, the market safely. So uh, where are we now, which is where so I take to started. So economically, there's no doubt we're in recession. At this moment in time, although there's rumors that this might um, go a little bit further, we're expect the recession that we're gonna go into is expected to last till the end of next year and then 2022 onward, we will recover. But there is now this talk of scarring of the economy. So you'll have seen lots of people being looking to be made unemployed. Um, I think Rolls-Royce is a big one, HSBC, there's some very big numbers there, but if you remember that's worldwide. So what we don't know is how much is gonna happen this year that we can't bring back in 2022. And that's the conundrum that we'll have certainly for the next few months. Politically, we've had a successful lockdown, apart from latest uh, uh, news over the weekend. Um, we've got a shaky unlocking. Um, and I think the teachers' uh, situation has really highlighted that and parents. Um, the fear is very high. They've almost done such a good job unlocking us down that actually everybody's terrified of coming out now. Um, and the trust um, is low. Um, but the government is still very, going to be very supportive of home ownership and also tenant rights. So those two are the things that uh, aren't gonna go away. Um, and from a property perspective now, you can definitely go out, buy, sell, invest, rent and let property. And that does include HMOs. So I've had lots of questions about HMOs um, and we've got some more advice, which is kind of a bit hot off the press for you uh, tonight as well. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. Um, the key messages are, so I sort of started with those when we we're talking about doing the viewings um, and uh, making sure that you really, really stick to as many rules as possible that stop this virus spreading because none of us want to um, be in that situation. So when they talk about the things that make the biggest difference, everything we read and heard about was it's hand sanitizing. So if you are a landlord and you're going into a property to show people around, sanitize your hands, have one of the little hand sanitizers or the wipes go into the property make sure that if the property has been empty for 72 hours it should be fine um, if other people just moved out the day before you need to do a deep clean of that property and make sure that all of the it sounds very um serious a deep clean it just means give it a really good clean with household disinfectants basically and make sure all the surfaces so it's handles it's taps it's all things like that are really clean keep a two meter distance where possible there's a ton of noise about masks um, I think if everybody wears a mask, it makes a big difference. But if not everybody does, it doesn't make such a difference. But from my personal thing, I've taken out of this, if I'm going to be within two meters distance of anybody, I'm wearing a mask. Um, and I do that, to be honest. I certainly do it when I go to the retailers because nobody seems to be able to keep two meters apart in when they're shopping at the same time. So, And then there is also important to take um, care if somebody's vulnerable or self-isolating. So... Um, you might, for example, this is particularly tricky in HMOs, but there might be somebody self-isolating in a room, in which case they would not ideally be out of the property if it was another tenant when you were showing someone around, or indeed um, they would just remain in their room um, and so that they weren't affected. Um, because, and it is just, they're little things, but they can make a, a big, big difference. Um, so that you have all of the information you need really easy to access, there are basically a hierarchy of uh, guidance. So MHCLG, which is the government uh, housing department, that comes first. So this is what you've got here is two things that you will need as a landlord. You will need the, and as a tenant indeed, you'll need the advice on moving home. So you should have a good read of that. It is easy to read, so don't think you're going to have to, it's not like Shakespeare or anything. It is, they, I have to say, they are a writer, but they are very, very good at making these easy. So, um, and then the other thing you need to understand is working safely um, in people's homes. So I have had reports where somebody's just, a landlord's just sent a gas safety engineer into a property to go and have the gas safe uh, check done. Great that you're doing that, but you cannot do that today. You have got to inform your tenants. You have got to ask the gas engineer lots of questions about whether they're likely to have COVID or not. You have got to ask the tenants the same question. You've got to make sure that that person who is going into the home, going into communal areas, 
absolutely sticks to the rules and understands them. And I have to say, I've been quite surprised at the number of electricians, gas guys, etc., that just don't seem to have been briefed properly by their organisations. Either they haven't read it or they're just the information's not coming out as well as I think is in this guidelines. So you get MHCL guidance first. And then under that, there is industry guidance. So this information uh, where it's got the downloads there, that is very much for you to read as well. It ties in perfectly with MHCLG guidance. No surprise because we did work really, really closely with this. Um, so there's not going to be any uh, conflict. If you're worried about any conflict or something doesn't feel right, let me know. Um, hopefully I could shed some light on that. And then because there are so many questions about HMOs, um, I have written a further guidance uh, well, it's not really guidance it is an article for myself i've checked it with as many people as i can so it's as accurate as i can make it interpreting the guidance guidelines that we've uh, we've come down so you get mhclg you get industry guidance um you get extra guidance like that and then on top of that this will really help you with tenants particularly if they're nervous about having uh, somebody else join um, an HMO, for example, or they're nervous about tradespeople, etc. So we've prepared these for you. They're free to access. Um, and it's the, the important thing about this for you as well as a landlord is if, if you don't read that, prepare for a property professional visit. You need to have read that because you need to make sure that people are doing that before they go into a property and meet your tenants, for example. But you also need to read that because if you're buying and selling property, and, your, and the property, the agent you're working with, the surveyor, whoever it might be, is not following this guidance, I'd really question whether you should be using them. And I'm very strong about that for the simple reason that um, these have been written with great care, with lots of consultation, and we're just trying to keep everybody safe. So uh, that's been our prime aim. It then gives you a list of what to do with viewings, property visits, and assessments. So whether you've got an energy assessor in, as I say, gas safe, electrical, trades guide to popping in or girl. Um, and then really important is if you've got tenants moving in, or indeed if you're moving into a property or have friends, the moving day is going to be much harder than it was in the past. You've got to have packed the day before, for example. Do not pack, try and pack on the day that you're moving out. And same goes for your tenants. Uh, and there's got places got to be cleaned. Ideally, if it's a let, left for, and you can leave it for 72 hours, that's the safest way because apparently all the virus disappears from the services, surfaces. So these are all here to help you. So please use them as much as possible. Um, so that's kind of just to really emphasize it. So we have opened up the market, but it's not as it was. So please, please take the time and effort to read that. If you've got any questions, you're very welcome to um, ask me. If you don't think we've done a good enough job, I'm happy to uh, take your questions and make sure I try and get you the best answer that I can. Um, but we're also dying to know the answer to that question of what is going to happen uh, to property prices and rents over the coming months. So um, we really are in uncharted territory here because we haven't got enough data because they closed our market. So it's only been open for a couple of weeks and typically it'll take six to eight weeks for us to get some decent data. However, I found this, I don't know if anybody else has used it, Yondel seems to be quite good. As you can see, they're, only, they're tracking back right to um, January 2019 what they actually look at is what the kind of live chat chat leads and things that they've generated so the way I've interpreted this is this is basically a bit of an idea about interest demand um, from all the different people in the property market and actually it's quite useful to see it because it does fit very well with the market as I remember it last year and then it does pick up the big bounce the kind of Boris bounce Brexit bounce whatever you want to call it that we saw at the start of the year then you can see the huge lull in activity, not a surprise, we're all doing our gardens or tidying our houses for at least the first six weeks. Um, and then what you see is this huge jump, be it tenants, landlords, buyers and sellers, um, in interest um, in the market. So it does suggest um, certainly that the market uh, is really buoyant, whatever sector uh, you are in. And other stats that I've just kind of pulled together for you, uh, HMRC showing that the market fell by 46% uh, in April um, compared to about 86,000 in March. That's actually amazing. Um, we're expecting, I mean, most, I think some of the other countries were seeing like 10% of the market being active. So the fact that that kind of number went ahead is quite astonishing. 20CI, which is actually producing some really good uh, useful data, Certainly seeing more demand um, from tenants in the form of agreed lets, 
So, um, of course, it's lower than it was uh, this time last year. Um, but what we're seeing is quite a big bounce versus February and March. Um, uh, and so we're really expecting that market coming back. There is a phrase where people have said landlords have been faster to come back than tenants. So if you're trying to kind of rent now, you might be a slightly worried and think, oh, tenants, there seems to be more properties on the market than tenants. I think that's just the market catching up with itself. So don't, don't worry too much about that uh, yet. Um, Zoopla, again, uh, they bought a home track, which is an excellent data resource. Um, and they're looking actually at um, demand returning in their sort of searches and everything they're doing about 30% higher than early March. So again, it, there are signs that the market really is picking up. And the way I look at this is I talk to agents and go, is this really happening or is this just a, a fluke in the stats and stuff? Um, but no, nope, they are telling me they are absolutely rushed off their feet, the ones that are opening. And then I thought, actually, if you have a look at um, this, I've taken some of the data out of here, but this is a really, really good article on the future of Vitalet um, and a very balanced article and some really good commentators in there. So um, I just thought I'd pop that in because that's really worth having a little look at. The right move stats are really interesting because they had their busiest day, I believe, of the year in 90, the 19th of May. Um, they're looking at about 11,000 new sales listings. I, that sounds a lot. I don't think it's huge for them, um, but we are talking that in a couple of, in a couple of weeks. Um, and again, you can see the stats there, similar to sort of Zoopla, are about 65% down on the same week this last, and we are talking like this uh, re very recent data here, um, and a huge increase, obviously, uh, versus lockdown. Um, so, and this is quite interesting. The total available stock is only about two and a half percent down before lockdown. So properties have stayed on the market um, for, for people to come in. And a very interesting stat, how long this will last, who knows. Um, but just 1% of the properties for sale have re been reduced over the last um, week. I'm very um, suspicious of stats like that. And I'll tell you for why. Uh, um, property went up for sale opposite my mum's the other day. And I don't know who had priced it, but it was so overpriced. It was ridiculous. Um, they clearly got the wrong agent in. I won't embarrass the agent that did it. Um, and I think within the first week, they reduced it by about, 50, by about 50, uh, 25 grand, 50 grand. Um, and that's still about 10 or 15% higher than it should be. So um, be a little suspicious about that, that data, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. Demand for rental property, they're seeing uh, really high. And asking rents, interestingly, um, obviously landlords are feeling a bit more positive. Um, so uh, they're sort of putting the, um, putting the rates up there. Um, whether that will last, I don't know. Job Rents are very much dictated by wage growth, and we're not really going to see that even in successful uh, companies like the retailers so much this year. So um, that just, I don't think that will be happening. So I, I wouldn't expect rent rises this year, if I'm honest. Um, uh, at all. So other news, uh, if you are sitting uh, on a property and you're not getting paid by your tenant, this is good news. Uh, my understanding is according to Landlord Zone and the lovely Paul Champlina who we were on with last time, uh, courts are going to be open from the 29th of June. Um, they're not going to be as we know them though. Um, suspended and new hearings are all allowed back in. It's going to be online uh, or, or by phone. Uh, quite how that works, I don't know, but I'll leave that to the techie gurus. Um, and I did think, and this is only my interpretation, but if I haven't, if the tenant doesn't necessarily have to go to court, they may well be more likely to engage online uh, or indeed by phone. So just beware of that. Uh, don't assume your tenant's not going to turn up because they haven't in the past. Um, and I do think it's definitely worth trying mediation first if you can, because I think that will probably help you, uh, as I say, Landlord Action, uh, which is part of the Property Redress guys, um, they've got a mediation service ringing and I think uh, uh, running now, and I think that would stand you in good stead with courts potentially. So have a chat with those guys about that. We've also got banks uh, extending payment holidays. And the biggest thing that I take out of that from an investment perspective is that one of the reasons why prices fall during a recession is because um, repossessions go up. So in the biggest year, I think it was about uh, I think it was about 75 to 90,000 repossessions in the 90s. In the biggest year in the, during the credit crunch, um, it was the biggest year was 45,000. And you'll even get 25,000 in a, in a good pricing year. Um, but my view is, well, if lenders are allowed to repossess properties, where are the government going to put the people? And at the moment, there's nowhere to put them. 
Um, homelessness has gone up by 165 percent since 2010. Uh, so we all know that's a massive issue. And over and above that, actually, it may well be the cheapest place to keep, keep people. So I wonder if we won't see maybe the prices drop so much. And one of my rationale behind that is because repossessions I think are probably going to be the lowest of any any recession because I think the government's going to try and keep people in them um, and just one other thing because it's easy to forget with all the noise that's going on is we're looking at mandatory electrical checks uh, in England are still required from July the 1st so if you have not booked that get booking um, because uh, we're not full steam ahead as far as electricians are concerned there's new regulations to get to grips with so make sure you get that done uh, so in summary, really, um, and looking forward to your questions later, it'd be really, really great to hear what you have to say and what you have to ask. Do make sure you understand the guidance. Um, contact me via the contact us at Property Checklist. And please, please, please put your and everybody else's safety first. Um, that's, that's exactly how we tried to write the guidance and to make that as easy as possible for you. Um, and let your tenants know as well. Communication with your tenants was a massive thing when this started. And it's a massive thing now to help them feel reassured that you're taking all of the safety guidance um, seriously uh, to allow them, particularly in HMOs, I think. Keep up to date with economic and property stats. And obviously, that's one of the main things that we do during um, uh, these sessions uh, and one of my favourite bits of the month, if I'm honest. Um, new information is coming out daily. So I, I sent this presentation to the guys on Friday and then I turned around and said, well, actually, I might have to update it Tuesday morning because who knows what's going to come out over the weekend. Sure enough, extra stuff came out. So um, and the other thing is to really understand we're going to see as soon as we're over this um, uh, dare I say Dominic Cummings, but as soon as we're over this issue, we, we really are going to have to understand and watch very closely to see what the politicians are going to do, uh, which is going to impact on the market. And then we can understand if that's going to impact positively um, or negatively. So um, that's me. I'm going to stop sharing now, I think, and hopefully hand back over to Alan. Thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. So much um, great context and, and important information. And as you say, the most important thing is everyone being safe and um, keeping everyone safe. So thank you so much for that. As um, Kate prompted there, this is an opportunity for you to um, raise the questions that you want us to cover at the end of the session. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you can um, look at the Q&A section um, on the Zoom link, um, you can raise your questions there and um, I promise we'll we'll cover those at the end. So um, please add them. I'm sure that's prompted lots of questions um, for Kate or myself um, at the end of the session. Um, I'm hopeful that that was a, a smooth switch over and you can see my screen now. Kate's giving me the thumbs up. That's great. Um, Apologies at the beginning, I forgot to introduce uh, one of my colleagues. Um, we also have um, Samuel on with us. Um, you may be able to see Samuel on the video link. Uh, Samuel is one of our mortgage experts uh, who works at Habito Brokerage. So Habito um, have given a wave there from Samuel. So fantastic for you to join us and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more and involve uh, hopefully Samuel in the discussions and questions that you've got for us later. So yes, as I introduced myself at the beginning, I'm Director of Lending Operations at Habito, but I, I guess it would be amiss of us not to take the opportunity to inform you as to who Habito is, if you don't already know. Um, so Habito, um, primarily, we're uniquely positioned as both uh, an online broker, um, a whole of market, um, but also now as a buy-to-let lender ourselves. Um, so we think that obviously puts us uniquely positioned uh, to be able to support you and uh, many with property needs and mortgage needs as we move forward. Um, we've been online, um, probably well recognised as um, an online broker since 2016. Um, we obviously um, we deal with both complex and direct residential and buy to let cases. We have mortgage experts such as Samuel who I've introduced you to. So just to prove that it's not a computer and an algorithm, we do have actual advisors available to, to deal with all of your inquiries and your needs to look at the whole of market. And we are free as well. So we don't charge anything for the advice that we provide. 
um, which is different to some brokers. Um, through this difficult COVID position, obviously being online and also open seven days a week, nine till 9.30, means that we're there at your convenience. We're available um, when you need us and also at weekends. So although we're all spending a lot of time at home, um, it's really important to con you know concentrate on the financial impact and having a look at obviously what you're paying on your mortgage and um, Habito is there to help you as a brokerage online as well. Um, additionally, as a lender, um, we started as a buy-to-let lender back in July of last year. Um, so we are um, able to provide you with um, portfolio, um, limited company and individual buy-to-let. Um, we have a number of uh, products uh, that we're available across five-year uh, fixed rates, um, leading from three, five, seven and ten years. Um, we, we stress rate um, those at the pay rate when it's above five, five years. And we also um, accept all types of landlords. So whether you're um, a, a first time landlord, experienced landlord, uh, portfolio landlord, uh, et cetera. So we're available for you there. We have a range of products available um, and we're looking at obviously coming through this situation, how we um, evolve our criteria going forward. Um, so that's a little bit about Habito. Um, if I move on into the slides, the next question that was raised and the subjects we wanted to cover was what's next for interest rates and, and also what do we see happening with regard to LTV lending by lenders. Now obviously when I was asked about what's going to happen next for interest rates, I was very much thinking of having a crystal ball available and um, kind of gazing into the future as to what that may look like. But I suppose for context, as, as Kate has mentioned, obviously we were excited to see the Secretary of State for Housing announce that the market was going to open up, but obviously to open up safely. Um, Habito works as part of an industry group led by Kate and some others to make sure that we um, supported and worked on the safe guidelines for that happening. Um, I guess critical to that as well from a lender's perspective was um, valuers being able to restart commencing physical valuations. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, moving through these different phases, there are, are difficulties in terms of getting people back up and running. Um, many, many firms had um, used the furlough scheme that the government announced to, um, uh, until work was to return. So I guess there are practicalities for them in terms of making sure they can return their, their workforce to the work and also to make sure they're adequately trained and aware of the guidelines so that they can clearly be safe and more importantly, uh, yourself and any tenants can be safe as they conduct uh, their, in, their inspections. From a lender perspective, I think as, as Kate mentioned, the market is moving fast, it's fluid. Um, you know, literally as we write these presentations, things are changing fast. I think what we've seen is, is certainly some move to return to up the LTV scales in terms of lenders. So where for a period of time, some lenders had uh, retracted from the market or reduced their maximum LTVs. We are now starting to see a, a gradual and welcome return to some of those, um, but there are some, some different caveats and some different views being taken by lenders. So it's important to um, have a look at what's available and, and what the criteria is and obviously that's where the likes of Samuel can can help guide you as well um, and then also in terms of products as well through through for um, through the lockdown we saw um, a significant reduction in the products that were available um, but we're now starting to see sort of uh, some of those products return and actually some 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 new ideas in terms of what products look like in the future um, so that's really exciting to see um, to mirror what Kate was talking about as a brokerage ourselves, we, we saw the initial um, uptick in terms of interest um, once the lockdown uh, release and the restart of the housing market was announced. Um, so we've definitely seen an increase in the number of people coming to us and wanting to chat about their mortgage requirements, which is fantastic. And, and we're delighted to be available to help them. And then that's mirrored by, I guess, some of the stats that Kate saw there as well in terms of estate agents, right move, also saying that they're seeing a lot of initial um, early interest uh, from a fairly, fairly dormant state. So we, we watch with interest how that evolves. Um, I suppose we'll, we'll no doubt get questions on this and we, we thought we'd touch upon it and probably Kate is more of an expert in this area than I, but in terms of um, what do we think is going to happen to property prices? Um, 
clearly that's an important aspect from a lender perspective and where they want to compete and where what interest rates they may want to uh, to offer in order to be um, competitive in certain areas so um, we pulled together by no means um, exclusive but you know a number of different in industry organizations that have a vested interest in the, the volume of transactions and the value of property. Um, just from this table, you can see that we, we have a mixture, but a general, general same trend in terms of the reduction in transactions that they expect to see uh, throughout the course of this year, as opposed to what was predicted. And, and clearly we've um, lost a significant chunk of the market with the lockdown and traditionally what is the the season for uh, looking at property and, and purchases um, I guess in terms of the trend and we can come back to this but there are obviously some sensational headlines and then there are others that are, are less so so I suppose navigating through just these examples I think it's fair to say as, as Kate mentioned we we are in recession there is expected to be some impact but we don't we don't know when it's going to come through, but certainly somewhere in a, a reduction of around 5% seems to be the base level. And then going into 2021, um, we start to see some recovery and some growth in house prices um, and leading to what Kate said in going into 2022, starting to, to recover and get back to in the early part of 2022, potentially where we were pre-lockdown. Pre so in terms of interest rates, I mean, obviously what we've seen is that from a buy-to-let perspective, about 85% of lenders have remained open during the COVID lockdown, albeit with a reduced product criteria um, uh, available. Um, I think it's shown resilience and adaptability in the market to, to remain and to support customers with their mortgage needs through this period. I think we're seeing um, signs of the innovation that this kind of situation should naturally create. So certainly in terms of product design, uh, maybe linking together uh, certain types of property, value of property, and, and potentially the type of valuation method that's used um, is definitely something we're seeing a mixture of things that are coming through. I think that the market remains competitive um, and robust. I mean, there are some very attractive deals available out there. Um, anywhere between one and 2% are available subject to certain criteria being met. And I think one of the key things that we see from a lender perspective that is certainly going to drive the competition and uh, potentially the products that are available and interest rates are available is the return of physical valuations. Um, this has seen a multiple of, of changes that have occurred in the last two weeks, literally as Kate said on a daily basis, it's very difficult to keep up with the interest rate changes, the criteria changes that we're seeing. I guess again it's it's difficult to know whether this in initial spike in interest um, is actually going to translate into actual transactions um, and stability in the market and obviously only time will tell as as Kate says as data starts to become more readily available and we start to see how people um, who had transactions are behaving and whether those transactions go through to fruition um, and then also how, how new entrants getting into the markets uh, look at the value of property. Um, I think from a lender perspective in terms of where they wanted to participate and any impacts of doing so I think the payment holiday deadline um, extension um, will cause an impact in terms of obviously the impact both in, from a lender perspective but also to the consumers impacted and I'll perhaps talk a little bit later in terms of what that means in terms of affordability and I suppose I, the last point I mentioned was obviously um, I think the Andrew Bailey governor of the Bank of England uh, there were some headlines last last week around potential for negative interest rates um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that's on the horizon but I think it's that the statement was rule nothing in rule nothing out I think these are unprecedented times and it's, it's difficult to know uh, what what stimulus is is needed and, and what support is needed and that's certainly from a lender perspective something we're we're working closely with government and various industry professionals to to feed into. So what about higher LTV mortgages? Well, from our perspective, as I said, I think the return of physical valuation has been one of the key uh, drivers to what we're now seeing with lenders starting to move from uh, their 
kind of lockdown position of restricting LTVs, uh, restricting property values, potentially across different areas and property types. Um, so I think that will give, as we start to see physical valuations being conducted and we see what those, those values are returning, we will, we will see consumer and lender confidence, or at least we'll know where the, where the benchmark is. Um, I think that we've already started to see, obviously, the return from the reduction in, in products that were available during the lockdown. We're now starting to see on a daily basis, particularly above 60% LTV, a return to more lending above 60% and, and more products being available. Um, definitely in terms of buy to let, we're seeing more lenders return to lending up to um, but in gradual stages up to 80 percent ltv um, and that you know depending on the type of lender that they're, they're kind of moving their way through the gears in terms of what they will accept and what the criteria for that is and then on residential purchases we're seeing um, certainly some return up to 90 percent and, and some speculation that we may may see slightly higher in the coming days so i think as i've said the key to um sustaining higher lending LTVs is confidence and a flow of transactions, um, evidence of, of where property is going to be valued post lockdown. And um, I'm sure Kate will talk about this more than I, but maybe just an assessment of where the different variance is in terms of regionally or property type or transaction type, where that may have a bearing on, on, on the value of the transaction. I think we're, we're key, as I said, to um, supporting and canvassing with local uh, with government and the housing ministry around uh, specialist lending um, who provide a, a significant um, support to to lending of high LTVs and different um, transaction types including buy to let um, so we've been putting forward ideas to to the ministry in terms of what support lenders need in order to continue to to provide um, products to consumers and also the stimulus that the market needs in order to continue to grow um, is such an important segment of the economy and obviously one of the reasons perhaps it was one of the first to be announced to reopen um, safely was obviously because of that input and and that significance um, and and hopefully a return to um, a more positive times and I think the last point I wanted to comment on was obviously going through this situation. I think it would be a shame, and, and Kate said quite rightly, don't expect that we're just going to go back to how it was pre-lockdown. Pre I think it would be a shame if we didn't see some further innovation and some flexibility and some further collaboration in terms of how, how lending is supported and how lenders uh, bring different products and criteria to suit different needs to the market. So I think it's... Uh, fairly fluid and definitely one to uh, watch in the coming days. So um, that's that's just a quick run through from my perspective and from a lender's perspective. I'm, I'm really excited obviously to, to hear what questions you've got for us. Um, we'll, if it's okay for you, Kate and, and Sam, we'll move into um, the questions. Um, the first one I was going to pick up perhaps one for you Kate to touch upon what I said about regional differences or property yeah. price differences what's your um what's your view on what we may see uh well so there's there's kind of two things really with this um so the northeast for example on average um so some will be doing better some will be doing worse are going into this recession with house prices on average 10 percent lower I should say that again because it is evening time lower than they were in 2007. So whether they will see any further reduction, um, whether that will then change that from a 10% to a 20% or because it's already at quite a low point and has never recovered from the last recession, actually we won't see any change at all because um, the market's already sorted itself out if you like. Uh, where as far as supply and demand is concerned, we don't know because we've never seen that before. Normally, every time we've gone into a recession, prices have been way overvalued. Uh, people have piled in before the 90s, piled in before 2007. But actually, certainly in a lot of places, we were seeing the market being quite quiet. London seeing fall, particularly, uh, particularly the prime market as well. Um, so you've got where's that market? And most markets are going into this recession with um, quite small levels of growth or they're actually lower than they were before. And then the second thing you have, and the best way I can describe this, is that this is going to be the weirdest recession we've ever seen. 
the simple reason that normally when you go into a recession, everybody suffers in some way, shape or form. Whereas now what we've got is, the best way I could describe it to you, if you take somewhere like, South, uh, like um, the coastal towns, they're going to be heavily reliant on catering and on entertainment um, for their economy to do well. Um, and of course, for those guys, this has been a pretty rough ride. Um, and they were, they were struggling anyway, but now they're going to be really struggling over the coming, coming months and, and next year, etc. So they may well see much bigger falls, if you like, um, than uh, the 5 10% that we, we've seen before. On the other hand, Cambridge is a fascinating place at this moment um, in time. And everybody kind of thinks, oh, London's not doing so well, let's go to Manchester. But I keep looking at the, particularly the Cambridge, Milton Keynes, Oxford corridor is fascinating um, because the amount of money that's going in there the huge infrastructure changes that are going in. It is only just, over, they are only just over an hour from London, those places. Um, and the it, Cambridge typically has the lowest unemployment level and a lot of the jobs are science, their universities, et cetera, et cetera. Issue with student um, market, of course, because they've put all their uh, student uh, um, teaching online, potentially for the whole of next year if they need. So I think it won't just come down to a region. So I talked about the Northeast. I think it will come back down, come right down to how's Cambridge going to do, how's Nottingham going to do, um, et cetera. And we are looking at doing some more work on that. Um, so it's really looking at, is your area, so Southampton is another interesting place, um, in the centre of Southampton, NHS and the council are big employers, not going to suffer, but of course the ports have had a terrible time. So you'll find even in one area like Southampton, they could have two completely different markets going on. So it comes down more than ever before. I think it will probably be down to an individual property on an individual street and who's competing for it. Two people are competing. It will go up in price or at least not, not fall. Um, and if you've got two, two uh, sellers chasing one buyer, that's when you're going to see prices fall. So um, exciting time if you like research. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, um, we've had quite a lot of questions, um, as you would have seen, Kate. So it's, um, it's difficult to know to how to cover so all of them in one go. Some of them, hopefully, we have covered as we've gone along. But um, there's some particular questions around uh, electric reports and, um, and also whether now is the right time to buy. I don't know if you... you well, heard of two, two interesting questions there. So let's do the electrical side first. Um, probably should have clarified earlier because with some of your questions. So the uh, electric rules coming in the 1st of July, they are if you are letting something that is to a new tenant. So if you've already got an existing tenancy and that's continuing, you don't need to do that until next year. But if, this is if you're letting a property, uh, somebody's moved out, um, then you do need to do it. Um, the best thing is, is your electrician and particularly electricians who belong to NAPIR have worked quite closely with people like the residential landlords associations on the electrical safety side. So it's about getting, um, making sure you've got a good electrician that understands and has kept up with the um, uh, buy to let. And the best ones I find are the ones that are landlords themselves. So um, very much taught, you should have an electrician that you know or talk to a local electrician and find out what they understand. Um, because they may have done this certificate for you and you just might not have realised it. There is a good question that I did see, which was whether the new build uh, safety certificate complies. That is a really good question and I believe it's a yes, but I'm going to go and check that out. So if we can hang on to your details there, um, that is a good question. But talk to your electrician and make sure that they haven't done a certificate for you already that stands you in good stead. Um, if your tenants are worried about having somebody in, go back to that guidance that I showed you earlier. Um, because you are allowed to send trade people in and as long as they do it safely um, and adhere to the guidance that we that, that from, from the government and industry they will be perfectly safe so um, worth worth doing that rather than breaking the law or if the tenants really put their foot down actually talk to your local housing officer and just make sure if you're not going to do it that you've got their approval um, because that might uh, might happen as well um, so the other time is the right time to buy uh, I, so I will give you my standard answer to this to some extent, which is it really depends on your personal circumstances and what you're trying to achieve and how long. If you're about to go on your buy-to-let journey for the next 15 or 20 years, you're going to have to deal with this uh, three or four times 
Um, and it's always going to come out in the blue, just like we were all worried. I remember when I first met, do you remember, Alan? And we were all worried about Brexit and we had <laughs> loads of conversations. And then suddenly this kind of swoops in and took us all a little bit. Um, sadly, it was not really a, a nice surprise, but, um, uh, you know, really took us uh, by surprise. Um, but hopefully we'll, we'll deal with it quite well. So for me, it depends on your personal strategy. What I do say is if you're putting a roof over your head, there's, there's, as long as it works for you, if you're having a baby, getting divorced, getting married, you probably do need to move. Just be aware that house prices might fall. And the most important person to talk to um, is your mortgage broker because they can mitigate the risks. So if you talk to somebody like Samuel Egan and you say, look, I'm really worried about buying, but I need to move. Samuel, how can you help me just in case prices fall? I, I don't want to be forced to sell the property. We've spoken about that before. Um, and that's the trick. And uh, people like Samuel can really make the difference between it being very stressful and actually not something that you need to worry about too much. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, I'll, gi I'll give you a short break now because I've seen a, a series of <laughs> lender, <laughs> a series of uh, lender-related questions, interest rates, um, payment holidays, uh, furlough income. So um, I'm sure Samuel will correct me if I get any of this wrong, but um, I think. The questions around obviously interest rates, as I covered, I think the market remains competitive. I think the pace in which lenders have moved to uh, start to bring back um, higher LTV lending, um, competitive rates, as soon as physical vows um, returned, we started to see some repricing um, in, a, in a downward direction in terms of rates. So I think that all bodes well, depending on obviously the, the, the transaction results we see and, uh, you know, assuming that we come out obviously of this um, phase uh, safely uh, from a lender perspective. So I do start, I do see lenders gradually working if they're not back up to the levels pre COVID um, in the coming weeks and months, they will um, be taking a view and, and looking at their risk appetite to make sure that they, they safely move forward and be able to provide that. Um, I think we've also uh, conscious of, you know, how, how the government supports lenders and, and the way in which different lenders across different sectors are funded. It's, it's different um, between different lenders who are deposit taking institutions uh, versus some of the specialist lenders that support um, buy to let, for example. Um, in terms of payment holidays, I think obviously um, the extension in line with the furlough scheme is uh, makes sense. I think the, the renaming from it being a payment holiday to a payment deferral is, is welcomed because I think that's the right terminology. I think people, there has been some suggestion that people that have taken payment holidays to date maybe wouldn't necessarily have needed to, but many of course did. So, you know, obviously that's that's important to assess correctly. I think from a lender's perspective, um, you know, certainly um, some of the bigger lenders have obviously been inundated and, and have had to man those requests. So perhaps has um, taken resource away from uh, the focus on, on the lending front to, to, to deal with those inquiries. I think from an assessment perspective in terms of affordability, I think we are seeing different lenders approach it slightly differently, whether someone has been on furlough for a period of time and obviously looking to seek assurances that that person uh, will return to um, employment with their employer and at the same levels that they were uh, pre, pre going on to furlough. Um, if not, um, you know, evidence of what their income was before uh, the lockdown and again evidence again that uh, they're able to return to those levels if they've either been put on furlough or have taken a pay cut in that period. Um, obviously payment holidays um, whilst from a credit reference agency perspective um, if you take a payment holiday it won't be noted on your your credit file but we are aware that some lenders are asking questions around whether a, an applicant has taken a payment holiday already um, so obviously you need to be aware that there are a number of criteria that lenders look at to assess uh, the underwriting of a case and the affordability of a case I guess on that I would echo Kate's point around using the services of of your mortgage advisor and experts such as Samuel um, because they they will guide you and support you and deal with the lender and find the best lender for the circumstances of that particular case and your, and your lending requirements so um, I think we are seeing different approaches um, and and it's and it is fluid and and I guess as as lenders come out of this they will uh, get more surety over um, individual 
circumstances, incomes, um, and and what decisions have been rightly made during this period. Right. Yeah. There's a good, really good question about um, will we start seeing precautionally lower valuations by valuers? Um, and um, so, for example, will they come in and say, "Well, we assume the market's going to drop by five or ten percent. We'll just drop everything by five percent." But my understanding, this might be a joint answer to some extent, my understanding is the values have to provide you with the evidence. Um, and so it doesn't matter so much what, whether, whether they, they, will, they shouldn't be coming in, and I've certainly heard lenders say this, shouldn't be coming in saying, oh, we'll just drop it by 5% because we think that's what the market's going to fall by. Um, it has to be evidence-based. That's why the surveyors went to university for five years to learn yeah. how to get the evidence. Um, so what they will be doing is looking to see um, what I'm talking to agents. So if an agent, for example, has just done uh, whether it, uh, I think say five sales in the last week, they will have and they're looking at a property nearby. If none of those, if those five sales have gone through um, at an accepted price or a sold price, um, the same as they were sort of pre-COVID, then they have to provide that evidence. So um, it's not an easy time for valuers, I have to say, um, because everybody's kind of looking to their professional indemnity insurance to, if they get it wrong. Um, but my understanding is they can't just come in and arbitrarily decide they're going to drop it by 5 or 10% because that's how they feel, because they have to provide the evidence to yourselves um, as to why they would be knocking it down by 5%. And that has to be that properties are selling for 5% less in that area. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely, Kate. I mean, obviously, our conversations with our valuers about returning and it is very much along the, the, the Red Book guidance they're given and, and their obligations to, to value in the current market conditions and based on evidence. So, as you say, unless they start to see um, fluctuations in, in, in the value of properties and the transactions and what they're going through, other, other than that, they will they will value based on the evidence and um I've seen some wording that Rick's issued in terms of obviously um, allowing for them to add to reports, whether or not, or the fact they're aware of, you know, obviously the COVID situation and, and whether or not it's had any, any impact on their valuation. But I, I concur with you in terms of their obligations, their professional indemnity and, and, and their, their job is to value based on the current market conditions and evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, Samuel, was there a question that you've noted? Did I see? Sorry. Yeah, um, we have one customer asking about two years and five year rates and what they should do. Essentially, this is a question that most house buyers will always ask because they're not too sure. Um, when it comes to picking a fixed period, um, I would always advise the customer to think about their own individual circumstances. Um, as a rule of thumb, your two-year rates are always going to be cheaper than your five-year rates. Um, but what you need to think about is what you intend to do with a property within the given time. Um, if you feel like you're going to keep your property for longer than five years, then remortgaging it every two years may not be a good idea because obviously there comes with um, arrangement fees, which can be anything up to £2,000 on buy-to-let properties. Um, if you go for the five year fix and you think, well, you know, I might want to release some equity from the property or I might need to sell it to fund something else. or I might want to trade up. Then you have to be aware that there will be early repayment charges. So again, you know, the difference between the two years and the five years isn't that much, but what should guide your decision is how you feel, what you would be doing with the property, you know, in, in three years time or six years time. Um, there was another question around, uh, uh, credit ratings or uh, your credit score different lenders have different approaches um, my advice would be to speak to someone like myself or if you have your own broker um, get him your credit report and he will be able to assess what's in there um, and give you an idea of how an underwriter will take a view of you know if there's any debts or if there's any CCJs or if there's any mispayments um, just to give you a bit of an idea Miss payments under a hundred pounds, not too much of a problem. CCJs, irrespective of the amount, lenders are not too keen on it. Um, the loan to value does have an impact on, on whether you will be accepted or not. However, you have to remember that with your decision in principle, it is you know information against an algorithm. So if the computer says no, 
sometimes you can appeal it, but a majority of the time it's just not going to fit with the lender. So I would advise speaking to your broker, getting your credit report, let them assess what's in the file, and then he'll be able to guide you or she will be able to guide you on how to go forward. So it's a good one about a stamp duty, Alan, if I've got time to answer that. Yeah, by, by all means. And uh, there were a couple of others that I was, was going to throw out there as well. So, yeah, by all means. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll do it as fast as I can. So the basic question was, will we get more relaxed stamp duty? Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I think my stats, about 80% of people don't pay stamp duty. I know if you're in London and the South East, it's, uh, it, it's a bind and I understand that. Um, but you only pay it, you know, so you pay it as you go in, not as you go out. And that's usually a good thing. Um, so um, I would have to say I think the industry would like to have that and would like to have it very soon. Um, I'm not the best person on this because I don't think the government should. I think there are other things they should be doing um, instead, which would help more people. Um, so mortgage guarantees, if you like, for 95% mortgages, I'd like to see those come back. Um, so uh, the, there will be a lot of ask for it, I think. Um, whether I doubt it will come this year, but I may be completely wrong. Um, I think they will see how the market goes over the next few months and see where we are in September. Because bear in mind, they've just spent a huge amount of money just keeping the economy going during lockdown. And I'm not sure it's one of the, there's a big hole in the stamp duty budget that they were expecting. So I'm not sure they're going to want to sort of keep that empty for much longer. I don't know if you feel any differently, Alan, but uh, you know, you know my thoughts. <laughs> no, I, I do. And I know it was a hot topic for debate when we were together with some, some industry professionals. Um, I mean, from a lender's perspective, I, I, I agree with you. I think um, that they will have a look at how the market behaves and, and, and what happens in the coming months and, and hopefully obviously we all move through this safely which is most important so um, I, I don't think we'll see anything this year but I, I think from a lender's perspective it, it was one of a few initiatives that we were suggesting may be needed but it depends on the circumstances and the right time but I, I think like you there are other things that um, we would like to see um, support the housing market and, and help us move forward in, in into growth into uh, 2021. Um, so yeah, I, I can't disagree with you. I think it's one of a, a number of levers that could be used, but I don't see it being used before the end of the year. Um, what were the other ones you had? Was... Yeah, the, the only other couple of ones, I suppose, practical ones. Um, I've seen a, just a quick question that um, I've seen that I just yeah, wanted cool. to answer. Um, to the anonymous attendee that was asking about informing their lender about the price drop. Um, in theory, yes, you are correct. Um, it should be okay. However, if you have been offered an older product, you may run the risk of having that product withdrawn. So my advice would be to let your broker um, speak to Birmingham Ishires, um and just find out if the offer is still available at the new um, negotiated price. That's all. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we, the only other couple ones quickly, Kate, before we need to um, close up tonight is um, there was one practical one about a tenant that was concerned about uh, safety checks because they've got a young child in the yeah. property and, and how practically the, the landlord deals with that. And, and also, and I don't expect you can cover it quickly, but where we are with the whole cladding issue. And, Okay, I can help with the cladding on a little bit, uh, point a signpost somewhere else. So, uh, in fact, I'll do that first. So, um, if, if we can take that question offline, but um, the Royal Street Chartered Surveyors are doing some really good work uh, around the cladding side of things. And um, just, a couple of, uh, just last week, they introduced some really useful information, uh, which will go some way to help answering those questions. And then I know some of the people that have been leading on that, so I'll get that question answered directly. But there is a lot of movement on cladding, so please don't feel that that's just disappeared uh, during lockdown. It absolutely hasn't. Um, oh, and, uh, oh, and then for the person that's worried. So um, let's just go back to where we were. If you've got a tenant that's worried about letting somebody in the property, Go back to the government guidance, the industry guidance, and you've got your consumer guidance there that you can, uh, the checklists, nice easy to read checklist that you can send them. Um, if I, basically you're allowed to do it and you, you should potentially do it um, if it's a legal requirement because otherwise you can be fined by the local authority. But if they are absolutely putting their foot down, um, then call the local authority and alert them to the issue also put it in writing and make sure that you have their authority, if you like, to hold off 
Um, but really, people have got to get used to the fact that it is okay for a tradesperson to come into your property. Um, and ideally, they can all be out. Um, you can off, they can, as long as they clean the property before and they clean the property after the tradesman, then they should, they should be fine and that's your door handles, etc. And again, that's all detailed in the guidance. So um, hopefully we've kind of answered all of those questions, but it is a matter of you really getting to grips with that. This is kind of new skill sets that you're going to have to learn as a landlord, I'm afraid. Um, and, um, uh, but the one nice thing is, is that we're making, is this is all consistent stuff. Um, so it doesn't matter whether it's a valuer going in, your trades person, you're bringing in a new tenant, whoever it is, all the guidance is exactly the same. So hopefully you can pick it up fairly quickly. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, that probably just leads us to conclude. I, I just wanted to let you know, in case you wanted to look back, we are going to put a copy of the recording of this um, meetup on our Facebook page, uh, Buy to Let Facebook page, and also on YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to look back. Um, I, it just leaves me to obviously thank Kate and Samuel for their attendance and, and contribution. I think that's been a fantastic debate. And also for all of you who have attended with your fantastic questions, it's, um, um, it's been fantastic to hopefully answer those questions. Um, so we'll bid you a good evening and uh, thank you for attending. Goodbye. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Cheers, Alan. Cheers, Samuel. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.